the FLIPI score, or the Follicular Lymphoma International Prognostic Index, has been around for some time and, and was devised in the era before rituximab. It's a little cumbersome at times to, to calculate. And, and now we have the new FLIPI 2 score, which um, is prospectively evaluated and, and, and prime time really for use in the era of rituximab. It uses five different variables that we commonly collect from patients and we can use the results of those five variables to categorize patients into three distinct risk groups. So that's uh, low risk, uh, intermediate risk and high risk groups. And this is discriminative both for progression-free survival and also for overall survival. So we're able to divide patients into three different risk groups. And, and this has become really the standard way of risk assessing patients. More recently, we have a new prognostic index in follicular lymphoma called the PRIMA PI. And this uses two variables. And these two variables are the beta-2 microglobulin and the presence or absence of bone marrow involvement. So it's a bit simpler to, to calculate. And actually, it performs very well also. Now, these scoring systems use um, clinical data, and um, increasingly we're wanting to incorporate the molecular data from our studies of patients. And the um, M7 Flippy is a system that has been devised by the German uh, low grade lymphoma group, adding uh, results of mutation analysis from patients with follicular lymphoma to the FLIPI score to increase its discriminative power. And what they did is they took um, 70 different genes that are recurrently mutated in follicular lymphoma and found a number that were associated most strongly with prognosis. And these were indeed seven different genes. And by looking for the presence or absence of mutations within this gene, within the follicular lymphoma sample, this could add clear value to the Flippy score. And this is the so-called M7 Flippy. Unfortunately, the M7 Flippy is not yet prime time for, um, for diagnostic use in the routine clinical practice. It is, needs some further prospective um, evaluation. There has been some conflicting results with different data sets, and therefore we are not using this in routine clinical care at present. But we are striving to incorporate biological markers to help us discriminate prognosis in follicular lymphoma. Making the choice as to when to start treatment in patients with follicular lymphoma is a real art. And it's, it's a discussion that you need to have with the, the patient, taking into account all this clinical information that you have. Remember, the presence of lymphadenopathy or the presence of this diagnosis is not an immediate need to initiate therapy. So we, we often take an expectant approach in about 20% of patients who are newly diagnosed. And this expectant approach is one of um, watching and waiting until the patient becomes symptomatic. And what I mean symptomatic, I mean that patients may develop pain from um, the lymphadenopathy, they may develop evidence of organ compromise, or they may have, have evidence of um, reduced blood count, for example. So in this case, this patient is symptomatic. The patient is tired, the patient has night sweats, the patient has a low hemoglobin and has a clear indication for initiation of therapy. We like to consider the importance still of watch and wait in this modern era of immunochemotherapy because we do recognize that patients who we can watch and wait, who have asymptomatic follicular lymphoma, on average, it's three years or three or, or two and a half years or thereabouts before they might require initiation of therapy. And indeed, 20% of patients who present with asymptomatic disease have not required any initiation of therapy 10 years from diagnosis. So I think even today, there's a very clear role for watching and waiting patients. But this patient has a very clear requirement for initiation of therapy.